Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, I have good news and bad news, which do you want to hear first? That's never a pleasant experience for me because I always wonder like, how bad is the bad news going to be? And is the, good, is the good news good enough that it's going to make that bad news a little bit more palatable? It's a dramatic question to ask somebody, and I wonder which one you would pick to hear first, good or bad news. I think if we were to poll everybody, we'd probably be around 50-50 on which way we do it. But in our passage this morning, Paul has decided to deliver bad news first, and it's pretty bad news. And yet, he doesn't linger long over it, because the good news that he shares after that is so good that it supplies the solution to the bad news he just gave. Now, we're in a sermon series right now in the book of Ephesians called United in Christ. And this morning, our passage is going to go over the terrible state of all of humanity without Christ. But then Paul will give us the good news of what God has done in Christ, and he takes the final section to explain how we can apply this good news to our own life and undo the bad. Now, this is an important and powerful section in Ephesians, and I hope that it's going to remind us of the foundational truths of the gospel and encourage us with good news that far outweighs the bad. But uh, why don't we just ask for God's help and, and commend our time to him through prayer. Father, we come before your presence once more, and as we open up this passage in Ephesians, we pray that your spirit would guide and sustain me in my thoughts and delivery, and God, that you would speak into each one of our hearts the truth that is contained here. Lord, if there's anyone here that isn't saved, that they would hear the gospel clearly, and that in your grace you'd call them to believe. And Father, for those of us who are saved, that we once more might be refreshed and encouraged in our salvation and deepened in our understanding of it. For we pray this for Jesus' glory and in his name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, I just want to reread verses 1 to 3, because I want to look at those ones first. You can look in your Bible if you want. I'm reading from the ESV version. I've got it up on the screen as well for you. It says this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our own flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So in these verses... Paul is describing for us the Ephesians' condition before they became Christians, and it's pretty bleak, isn't it? And this actually describes the condition of everyone who has no faith in Christ and for every believer before their faith in Christ as well. Paul here uh, says very plainly from the very beginning that we were dead in trespasses and sins in which he once walked. And you might be surprised to hear Paul talk about them as being dead, right? That's, that's strong language. What does he mean by that? Well, surely he doesn't mean physically dead because he was speaking to live people, but he means, in this case, spiritually dead. You see, uh, a person might have all the strength and energy of an athlete, all the vibrancy and creativity of an artist, all the, the magnetism and charisma of a movie star and still be very much dead. See, the, dead in the sense that they're entirely unresponsive to God. They don't see his glory in creation. They don't hear the call of the gospel upon their lives. They don't feel any pull to turn to God. They are very much dead. There's no spiritual life in them at all. After making similar comments, John Stott continued saying, so we should not, oh, let me get to it there. Let me say, he said this, so we should not hesitate to affirm that a life without God, however physically fit and mentally alert the person may be, is a living death, and that those who live in it are dead even while they are living. See, long ago in America, when someone was given a, a capital uh, punishment, so they were going to be executed, before they moved that prisoner around, the guards would call out, dead man walking, to warn people that someone going by was a person as good as dead. According to Paul, that could be declared over the entire 
human race. See, we're dead in the guilt of our sins with God's death penalty hanging over our heads. Now, Paul makes the point that we are dead in sin, but he isn't done. He's going to continue to detail three different enslavements that all people are under when they're dead in their sins. These are the three classic enemies of our souls known in Christianity. First, he describes how they are following the course of this world. Now, the world here means humanity organized and run without any reference to God whatsoever. Society around us has a huge impact. It has an influence upon us, doesn't it? And often that influence is to draw us away from God, calling us that we can divine what is good and evil, calling us to live out whatever desire we might have. We can be like a twig caught up in the current of our times, carried along by the streams of this world, enslaved to the world's influence. But Paul adds a second enslavement, saying that they were following the prince of the power of the air. Now, this is actually referencing Satan, and he was referred to by Jesus as the prince of this world three times in the Gospel of John. Here, he's described as the prince of the power of the air, because air gives a sense of something that can still represent the spiritual realm, but under heaven, so lower, a lower spiritual realm that is close to earth. And that's making what the point Paul wants to make about uh, Satan's rule. And he continues and says that Satan is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, my wife always likes to try to find family resemblance, especially between parents and kids. She can always say she sees it, even when I sometimes can't. But that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying that the sons of disobedience, that's all of us, we look like our parent disobedience. That means that we are marked by disobedience, that we are sinners. That's his point there. And, and Paul is telling us that part of the reason that we are sinners is that Satan is working in lives. And finally, Paul points to our own desires as another enemy to righteousness and enslavement to sin. And we often call it the flesh. He writes, we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind. Now, when we think of passion of the flesh, many of us, our minds turn to sexual sins. And that's included in that category, but we certainly shouldn't, certainly shouldn't limit it to that. But it would include any desire toward evil. And he subdivides it here between um, desires of the body and the mind. And his point here is just the full extent of the corruption of sin within us. It isn't just bodily desires that sometimes get out of whack. We, 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 we want things corruptly, a desire, a good desire for sex turns to lust, a good desire to food turns to gluttony, a good desire for rest turns to uh, laziness. He doesn't just mean that, but he's also talking about our very minds being corrupted by the sin that indwells us so that we can't think clearly about moral issues. We are entirely corrupted, sinful through and through in both body and mind. See, these are the three great enemies of our souls. The world, the devil, and the flesh. They're always acting upon us, drawing us to sin. And it's never just one of them, but all of them together trying to enslave us. I remember when I was in China, um, there was a young man who claimed to be a Christian. He was sleeping with his girlfriend, and so we had to confront him on it. And his answer was, the devil made me do it. Surprised by that answer. That's not the kind of answer you'd ever hear here, is it? I, I've never heard a Westerner, a Canadian, say, oh, the devil made me do it. He did. Now, what would a Canadian say? Oh, you know, I mean, my own desires, I got carried away. Or, you know, this world, it just normalizes casual sex. All my friends are doing it. I got off on the wrong path. But rarely would we say the devil made me do it. Now, this young man, he was so focused on one of the enemies of his soul, he was completely ignoring two other very legitimate enemies that were certainly part of the reason why he fell into sin. And yet, before we're too hard on him, we're kind of the same, aren't we? We're kind of the same, because we, we'll, we'll admit we struggle with the flesh. We'll, we'll talk about struggling with the influence of this world, but how many of us talk about demonic influence in our lives? Oh, that's not very fashionable in churches today to talk about how the devil is influencing us and working us as an enemy to our souls. We don't like to talk about that because it's not very respectable. 
is it? I mean, we don't get the same respect from this world. If we talk about our own desires getting twisted or, or society having a negative influence upon us, the world kind of, yeah, maybe those Christians are a little weird, but okay. But you start talking about demonic influence and they laugh at you. They laugh at you. And sadly, I think embarrassment has caused us to ignore one of the three classic enemies of our souls that Christianity throughout the history has always talked about. It's very biblical. It's right here. And how can we battle sin when we only focus on two-thirds of the problem? No wonder we often fail. No wonder we often struggle. We've got to recognize that all three of these enemies are acting against us. They must be resisted. They must be worked against. Now, you might say, wait a sec, wait a sec. You said I'm enslaved. Who blames the slave, right? That's not fair. What choice do I have? Like the young man, the devil made me do it, right? Isn't it forcing us? Isn't it controlling us? Well, Paul talks about how by nature we're children of wrath. He's pointing out the sinful nature within us. And so, yes, we are enslaved. But don't make the mistake of thinking we're helpless victims. No, no, we're more like guilty accomplices gladly going along with the call to sin. There's a part of us that is very much alive that loves sin and goes in along with the following without twisting any arms whatsoever. And so Paul said here, and I want to look at this a little bit more carefully, he said that we're children of wrath. Now that's a little bit like sons of disobedience, where sons of disobedience just meant people marked by disobedience because of that family resemblance to our parent disobedience. Well here, children of wrath is similar, except meaning that we are marked by wrath, not by something that we do, but something that we do caused us to be marked by wrath. The sinfulness that we fall into calls for a holy God's wrath against us. And his wrath isn't like human anger unpredictable and explosive. We all know that person who has a bad temper. You have to kind of walk around on eggshells around them because you're not quite sure what's going to make them blow up this time. Well, that is completely unlike God. God's wrath is very much under his control, and it is absolutely predictable. John Stott said this about God's wrath. It is God's personal, righteous, constant hostility to evil, his settled refusal to compromise with it, and his resolve instead to condemn it. Anyone and everyone who sins can know that their sin has called for God's wrath, and thus they're condemned before him, and have the terrible expectation, not only of this condemning wrath, but eventually of the eternal destruction within hell. Now, Paul has painted a terribly bleak picture of our condition without God, dead in sin, enslaved to the world, the devil, and the flesh, condemned under God's righteous and just wrath over our sins, and finally with an expectation of eternity in hell. That is bleak. See, like a good physician, Paul is calling us to realize the seriousness of our condition before he comes to the cure. And here, he's, letting us see, he's calling us to recognize your spiritually dead state. See, if we want to change, we have to begin by admitting that there's a problem. See, positive hope only follows after a dose of hard truths. Just like a patient has to admit to the disease before they're going to seek treatment, we have to face the problem that lies before us, that lies within us. So let's just keep reading to see what Paul prescribes to heal us in verses 4 through 7. We've got through the bad news. Let's start into the good news. He says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that at the, in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Two little words, but God. Two little words that can change an entire destiny. See, 
We were in a hopeless state and completely unable to do anything about it ourselves. But God, we were spiritually dead, completely unresponsive and in glad slavery. But God, we were condemned for our own sins and justly so and facing an eternity in hell. But God, but God stepped in. God interrupted. God changed everything, didn't he? Martin Lloyd-Jones commented these two words in and of themselves, in a sense, contain the whole of the gospel. And lest we forget when he did all this for us, Paul is clear that this was even when we were dead in our trespasses. See, we didn't fix ourselves up first. We didn't make ourselves more appealing or deal with our sin. God acted exactly when we were still very much dead in our trespasses and sin. But you say, what did he do? What was this action that's such good news? It says he made us alive together with Christ. Now that might sound strange, especially if you're new to Christianity, but it's talking about something here called union with Christ. When we're saved, we are united with Christ, so his death and resurrection directly benefit us. Through faith, we are so identified with Christ that what God did to Christ, in some sense, also counts for us. See, we live because he lives, and we be united to him in faith. He died in his death, he died for our sins also, and we share in his resurrection life. That's part of the benefit of of, um, this union with Christ that we receive through faith. If you want to think about it, another way, just to give you a a mind picture, it can be a little bit like a Venn diagram. You know, those are those circles overlapping, and it shows what things are shared in common and what are different. Well, in this case, when we think about union in Christ, it's just Christ is one big circle, and us as tiny little circles inside him. So what is in him, in some sense, we can share. In some sense, we benefit from. In some sense, we are blessed also through it. So how does this work? In this way, God undoes our dead state because we've been made alive with Christ. Paul is so struck by the beauty of this statement. We're made alive with Christ that he bursts forth in praise to to God a little bit early. He can't help himself. He just breaks it. By grace, you've been saved. He's trying to save that for verse 8, right? That's the famous part where he says these same words. He's going to explain it more in verse 8, but he can't hold back. He's like, this is all grace. We were dead in sin, and God made us alive. Dead men can't save themselves. Dead men can't bring life to themselves, but Christ, God through Christ, has given us life. So he bursts out because it's all grace, isn't it? That's God's undeserved favor and help to sinners like us. Paul expands here on what it means to be made alive with Christ with two different statements. First, he says that God raised us up with him. And here we see that resurrection is the cure for those who are dead in their sins. And God takes our dead, unresponsive hearts, and he makes them come alive with the very life of Christ in us. Then he mentions a second, often overlooked benefit of our union with Christ um, and being made alive with Christ. He says that God seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I know my last sermon was a little while back, but in that sermon, we explored what it meant for Christ to be seated at the right hand of God. And we talked about how that meant a completed work of salvation, and now his state of being glorified and not reviled anymore. But we also talked about how that pointed to his authority, his power, and his victory. You know what? That is really good news for us. It's because since we're united with Christ, in some way we share in his powerful victory on the cross. That means in a small but unimportant way, that victory that God gave Christ, seating him now in a place of authority, we share in that in some small way. And that's the answer to that enslavement that we have to the world, the devil, and the flesh. By ourselves, there's nothing we could do about it. But we've all, it's already all been conquered by Christ on the cross. 
So enslavement ends in release for those who are united with Christ. It's kind of like a jump for, for sinners like us, similar to Joseph, who went from being in the very prison to standing beside the king of Egypt. For us, it's this massive change of, of destiny and massive change of our state. Christ's victory becomes ours. And these three enemies of our souls no longer have any claim over us. Even Satan, who is rather intimidatingly called the prince of the power of the air, how can he stand against our Savior, who is called the King of kings and Lord of lords, and sits enthroned at the right hand of God in the heavenly places? See, we're with him. We don't need to fear these things anymore. They've been conquered in Christ, and we have that victory from them. We are not slaves to them anymore. Our ultimately victory is assured. We may struggle with them in this life. We do. These are still enemies of our souls. But our ultimate victory is assured. And because we are no longer slaves, because of the freedom we found in Christ, that means, brothers and sisters, that we can and should see gains in our life against persistent sins. It is possible, and it is something that we can have in Christ. Now, another question that might come to mind in all of this is, like, why is God doing this for us? We have these massive problems. There's not much in us that's very attractive. Why is God helping us? Have you ever had someone help you, and you wonder, wait, wait, why, why are you helping me in this way? Is there a catch? Do you have an ulterior motive here? Or is it all kind of not quite work out in the end? I think we've all been disappointed by people who've tried to help us, and we've all been hurt, too. Well, Paul wants to lay out for us God's motives very clearly so we can see for ourselves why he's doing all this for us. And he, he, he starts out with who God is. You might say, wait a sec, you already told me who God is. He's a God of wrath. That doesn't help me. Yes, he is a God of wrath. I'm not going to soften that or try to change that. He's a God of wrath, and he hates sin. But he's also more than that. Verse 4 tells us that he is rich in mercy. He's chosen to show that mercy to us. It continues and says that he has a, he has a because of the great love with which he loved us, so God has great love for us. And God is not only merciful and loving, but verse 7 continues to point other, out other characteristics about him. And here we see that he has immeasurable riches of grace and that he acts in kindness toward us. You see this? These are also his characters. How does God move from being inclined toward us in wrath to suddenly being merciful, loving, gracious, and kind? Well, that's happened because of Christ. See, God's wrath over our sins was satisfied by Jesus dying in our place on the cross. The demands of justice for punishment of our sins were met in Jesus' death. So Jesus' death doesn't just bring us resurrection and release, it brings us rescue from the condemnation that God's wrath justly brought upon us. We deserve that wrath because of our sins, but we're rescued from it because of Christ's death in our place. And the purpose of this rescue is further given, a second motivation, not just who God is, but another reason in verse 7. Just to look at this carefully, it says, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. See, ultimately God saved us for his glory. Yes, he is merciful and loving, gracious and kind but also, or maybe perhaps because of this, he's also deserving praise. And he will see that praise brought to himself. And this isn't something new. When we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, as Paul talked about salvation at first, he kept repeating this. He kept saying, why is he doing it? To the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. God is doing this for his glory. Brothers and sisters, we are on display for all creation to see. Imagine right now, created beings jostling, trying to stare at us, looking at us. Why did he save them? And as they, as they look at us and examine us, they can only come to one conclusion. Because of his incredible matchless mercy, 
because of his boundless love. Why else would he save sinners like us? We're living, breathing testaments to God's incredible grace. Just like a healed man is evidence of the skill of a physician, forgived, forgiven sinners like us are evidence of God's kindness and his wonderful love. You might say, well, is this all automatic? This is great. All of humanity saved? No, because Paul is clear that we have to receive this grace. He wants you to not just recognize your spiritually dead state, but to let God make you alive with Christ, to let him save you in this way. And the remaining verses that we're going to look at are going to explain how you can receive this salvation. Let's just look at them now. Verses 8 through 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So these are some of the most famous verses in the Bible, I think, and for good reason. They express the very essence of the gospel with a profound but simple explanation of how we can receive salvation from God. Now, they're well worth committing to memory. If you haven't already memorized these verses, I suggest you start that this week because they're great for your own soul to remind you of these foundational truths about the gospel. They're also great when you're talking to someone else. So I suggest it very much. See, this simple explanation of how we can save starts with grace. And considering what we just read, that shouldn't be very surprising, should it? It's by grace we have been saved. We've been saved. Remember, grace is speaking of God's undeserved favor and help for sinners like us. Salvation isn't about deserving it. It's about grace, right? And it's received through faith, right? When we put our faith in Christ dying on the cross in our place for our sins, and that God can make us alive together with Christ, we are saved. But immediately after, save, after explaining what salvation is, it's by grace, it's through faith, he wants to talk about some common misunderstandings that people can fall into. And he begins by saying, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. It begins by saying, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. You see that in verse eight? This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. See, we're all tempted to think of salvation as a transaction. That's kind of like something that happens between us and God. A transaction is like if I need something from the store, I go to the store, I take the item, I give the money, an exchange happens, a transaction is done. Well, we think about salvation that way. God's got something I want, salvation. I've got something he wants, faith. I give him faith, he gives me salvation, transaction complete. But that couldn't be further from the truth. I don't provide faith to buy God's salvation in any way. Faith is, uh, the classic example is more like sitting on a chair. You rest upon it. You just trust that the chair will hold up your weight. Your faith in the chair doesn't make the chair hold you up. It's just part of your choice to trust it. That's all, to sit in it. Or maybe think about it like brakes in a car. When you press the brakes, you're not the one that stops the car. The brakes are. All you've done is the trust that the brakes will do what they said they would. In the same way, we put our faith in Christ to, to believe that God will do what he said he'll do. He'll forgive us. He'll take Christ in our place. That's what we're trusting in. There's no exchange going on. Faith isn't a payment. It just is the means by which we trust and accept for ourselves what God has already done in Christ. That's why Paul tells us it's a gift, right? A gift can't be paid for. It can only be received. If I were to buy my wife uh, I better keep it to something simple so I don't get expectations. Of, buy my wife a nice bouquet of flowers. Nice bouquet of flowers. Sorry, honey, I can't say any rich jewelry. A nice bouquet of flowers. And she were to say, ah, oh, this is really lovely. I like these flowers. And then she grabs her purse and starts rifling through and then hands me money. Is that receiving it as a gift? No, that's rejecting the gift, right? That's turning a gift into a transaction. That's an insult, isn't it? A gift must be accepted with open hands, not with payment. 
in this passage, it's urging you and me to be very clear that we can only receive salvation as a gift from God through faith that just takes hold of it with gratitude. All that God has done for us without any thoughts of payment of any kind. Paul wants to continue to be really clear. And he says, not a result of works so that no one may boast. See, we can't change our ways or do enough good to, to earn our way into heaven. No one's going to be boasting when they get to heaven like, man, did you see how awesome I was? What a great Christian I was. That's why I'm here. I don't know why you're here. That's why I'm It's not going to be that way. Dead people can't be talking about being saved that way. It said God saved us even while we are dead in our trespasses. We're not going to be bragging. Can you imagine Lazarus after he's resurrected saying, well, I know why God, why Jesus chose to resurrect me. I mean, I died so good. And then did you see how I wore those grave clothes? No corpse looked as good as I did. Man, of course he picked me. No, that's ridiculous. Of course he didn't say that. Of course he didn't. Dead men can't save themselves. They just need resurrection. They can't make themselves alive. Slaves can't free themselves. They need release. Condemned people can't get out of their punishment. They need rescue. Brothers and sisters, if there's going to be boasting in heaven, it's not going to be about us and what we did. It's going to be about our God and our Savior and what he did, right? Remember verse 7? We're going to be talking about the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That's where the boasting is going to lie. It isn't about what we do. If you're a Christian, or if you're new to Christianity, maybe you're not a Christian this morning, let me be clear. We are not bragging that we're saved, like that says something about us, or our quality, or our character. We're telling you that we were dead, but we were resurrected in Christ, that we were enslaved, but we were released from that, that we were condemned and justly so, but rescued. See, and we're telling you that you can be too. We're not claiming to be above anyone else or more deserving. We're just saying, we've got this. You can have this too. Why not take it? You can be saved too if you will just humbly admit to your hopelessly sinful state that you can't earn your way into heaven. It isn't about that at all. You can't change it. You can't turn over a leaf big enough to make you deserve to go there. Instead, you can turn in faith to Christ who died for your sins and humbly admit that he saved you and you can be made alive with him through faith. See, accept let me get ahead. Accept God's gracious gift of salvation through faith alone. Put your faith in this and be saved. Verse 10, I think it kind of talks about something that we can still struggle with. Often before we're saved, this is a struggle for people. But even after we're saved, we can struggle with this question. We think to ourselves, isn't it true that doing good is really important in the Bible? And then, if that's the case shouldn't have something to do with salvation. I mean, you say I'm saved by faith and not by works, but don't works come into it somewhere? Well, yes, yes, they absolutely do. But the work is all about God's work, not our work. Look at verse 10 and what it says here. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see that? Whose work is it about? His. His workmanship. See, we are God's masterpiece. We are God's work of art. After all that bad news, that's kind of nice to hear, isn't it? We are God's masterpiece, his work of art, his workmanship, demonstrating his grace for all of eternity. It's a little bit like the Mona Lisa hanging up on the Louvre. You can go there and you can just wonder at the brilliance of Leonardo da Vinci as an artist. In the same way, we're on display for the universe, demonstrating God's unparalleled grace. That's what's at work here. See, it's his work on display, not ours. And that's really important. It says, though, continues, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. And there we see the good works. That's where our good works come into play. 
We're saved to do good, not because we did good. Do you see that? Good works come after our salvation as a result of it, not before to cause it. We need to be clear on the order here. It makes a big difference. We don't, it's also important that we realize that we don't stay saved by doing good either. That's sometimes what people think. Oh, now it was gr God's grace that I was saved, but now I've got to keep up the good works. I've got to keep up the standard. Otherwise, God might reject me and I'll fail out of heaven. I'll flunk out. Absolutely wrong. It started with grace. It continues with grace. See, we are intended as a display of God's grace, not just at our salvation, but for the rest of eternity. That's what's going on here. So it never ends being about grace. There's never a point at which we are earning it or deserving it. Look at um, Ephesians, uh, Romans chapter 11. Get it there. So Romans chapter 11 says this, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. It doesn't have anything to do with works. Why? Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. When you say that your good works are helping you get saved or are keeping you saved, you are actually stealing glory from God. You're saying, yeah, it was grace maybe before, but not anymore. Absolutely not. It is grace from beginning to end to suggest your works are somehow meritorious, somehow deserving, making you deserve anything is an insult. Do not do it. Do not steal God's glory. It's his glory from beginning to end because it's his grace from beginning to end in our salvation. And by the way, all those good works that we're doing to try to earn our way or to prove something or to keep something, it says that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, from context, as we've been studying through Ephesians, we know this beforehand actually means before the creation of the world. Before you breathed a single breath, before this world was even made, God planned the good works that you were trying to offer to him to pay your way into heaven. They're not your works. God is doing them through you. Do you see that? You're offering something to him that's already his. It's not yours. It won't work. It's just foolishness. It has nothing to do with the gospel. See, he prepared them beforehand that, so that we would walk in them, not work in them. Our job is just to walk by faith in the works that God planned before he created this world for us to do, and he does them through us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So all the glory goes back to God, not just for saving us, but for every good work we ever do. Glory be to God, not be to us. There is no boasting in heaven, but boasting in our Savior. Do we see this? We need to get this, we need to have it clear, because this is the heart of the gospel. And this rebel, our, our, our sinful selves rebel against it, because we want to have our part. We want to have our play. I, I'm, I'm proud. Have you ever tried? I, I wasn't planning to say this. And forgive me, I hope I'm not going to insult anybody. This is always dangerous when you say something off the cuff. But have you ever tried to, to give certain Chinese people something? They've got to give you something back. You ever seen that? They got to repay. Oh, you gave me this. I, 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 let me get you something back. They want to always repay back. And that instinct within, and that's not just Chinese people, by the way. That's a lot of people because we're arrogant. We're proud. We don't like to be other people's debtors. It's the truth. All of us can be that way. Don't be that way with God. It's ridiculous. What can we give him that isn't already his? It's ridiculous. Take it by as a gift. There is no other way to take it. If you try to pay for it, then you're actually rejecting it. Receive it as a gift by grace and faith alone. If you're not saved, my appeal to you this morning, if you don't know this, oh, I, I missed one point. I got excited there for a sec. I missed one point. It's an important point too. I, I want, let me go back. Um, it says here that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Created in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? See, when God saved us, it isn't just a matter of him reforming us a little bit, him just trying to up our level a little bit in moral living. No, he had to start all over again. He had to recreate us here. We were so condemned, so sinful, through and through. It required a new creation in Christ. So when we were made alive in Christ, one of the things that happened that we became a new creation in him, a whole new nature put within us. That's the grace of God. So those who are can just destined for hell, that's where we belong. By nature, children of wrath get recreated as a solution to that. Didn't want to miss that part, but let me just finish by this final appeal. If you're not saved this morning, 
you're hearing this, you're wondering, well, wait a sec, I actually think I'm a pretty good person. I hope that you've been able to see that's not the case, that we're sinful through and through. Maybe you're thinking, well, what is this grace? How do I really receive it? Well, I just want to go back and make this point one last time. See, I want you to recognize your spiritually dead state. There's nothing that we can do that will impress God. We're enslaved, we're dead, we are condemned by his wrath, and we're destined for hell. But let God make you alive with Christ. How do you do that? Well, you do that by accepting God's gracious gift of salvation by faith alone. It's a gift. Receive it through faith. Now, if you're saved this morning, remember, you didn't earn it, and you don't keep it by your good behavior or by maintaining a certain standard. It's all grace. And we are going to be, and are right now, God's masterpieces, demonstrating his grace to all of creation so that they will praise him. Now, if they praise him looking at us, going, wow, God, you are gracious, loving, merciful, and kind, because they didn't deserve this salvation at all. If that's what other beings looking at us say, angels looking in going, oh, God, I praise you for saving them. Isn't it right and good that we should praise him for saving us? Isn't that something that should flow from us? Let us this week, I pray, have hearts full of praise for our God in his graciousness, saving sinners like us. I hope that you think about that, not just after this sermon, not just a few minutes later, but for the rest of this week. When you're feeling down or when you have a few minutes, consider this beautiful truth. God graciously saved you and praise him for it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the heart of the gospel in these verses. May these beautiful verses burn into our hearts and minds. May they come up and may we think of them again and again. And may they bring us to a place of praise. Lord, you deserve all the praise because you gave undeserving people, sinners like us, a way out. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for resurrection life in us. We thank you, God, for the release, the rescue, and the recreation that we have in union with Christ, our Savior. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.